Welcome to the Great Man Within podcast. Every episode is designed to help you discover and live the great man within you. Hey, just one more reminder that starting Monday, July the 6th, we will be moving this podcast from a three day a week frequency to a Monday and a Friday. So two days a week frequency. Mondays will still be the long form episodes where Brian and I typically interview an outside guest. And then Fridays will be these solo episodes like today's that I'll be releasing each and every Friday. So in keeping with the theme of the last podcast that we released on Monday, which was Detox 101, How to Know If You Need a Detox, featuring Josh Mason from the Detox Dudes, I am now finishing day number two of a five-day fasting protocol. And I feel pretty good, to be honest with you. I expected to feel pretty beat down. I I figured I wouldn't have full access to my brain functioning capabilities, although I guess we'll wait till the end of this episode and you can tell me whether or not my brain was fully functioning, but I feel pretty good. And to be very clear, I'm not doing one of those five-day water fasts. I'm actually doing a fast mimicking protocol, which basically means you get to do a fast with some caloric intake, but at a dramatically reduced level of calories you would have on a normal day. Yesterday, day number one, I had 1,100 calories I had 800 today, and then I'll have 800 the next three days. And I bought this really simple system called Prolon, which I found out about through watching Gwyneth Paltrow's show, Goop, on Netflix. There was one episode on longevity, how to extend your life, and they explored a number of different diets. And fasting, which I've heard about not only on her show, but through Ben Greenfield and many other nutritionists and specialists, fasting is like almost one of the surefire ways to help reset your system, clean out your system, make your system stronger. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to do a deeper dive into the, into the concept of fasting at a future point when I have a chance to bring on a real expert and I'll also be able to tell you about my experience. Uh, so I will link Prolon in the show notes, not because uh, I recommend it yet because I'm only on day number two and I want to see what the whole experience is like, um, but because it's been, you know, it's, it's what I'm using right now and because it's pretty simple. It basically comes with a box that gives you all of your food for day one, two, three, four, five. It's, it's as easy as you could possibly make it. It's 250 bucks, so it's not inexpensive, but I'm paying for the ease uh, and the clarity of not having to think through this because I figured I wouldn't be 100% anyway. Um, but I'm feeling good about, about the very fact that I'm actually doing the fast because this is something that has scared me for a while to stay off of caffeine, to not be able to eat what I want when I want. The idea of being like five straight days at not my best physical, mental, emotional, energetic capabilities is something that like scared me. And so the fact that I'm actually doing this now feels like a win for me. And I thought that story could be a great precursor or primer to the conversation we're gonna have today about how to shift unwanted and persistent behaviors because many of us have unwanted behaviors when it comes to our relationship with food, whether it's eating too much dessert, eating too many breads, eating the foods that give you indigestion. For me, uh, caffeine was certainly something that, like I felt just like compulsively driven to drink more and more caffeine, even though when it blew out my nervous system and I felt anxious and I felt frustrated throughout the course of the day, I still found myself craving and drinking way too much coffee, even when it wasn't good for me. And I learned how to change my relationship with caffeine and also desserts and also really crappy cereals that I used to eat in the morning, sugar cereals that up until probably like eight years ago was my lifetime, was like my my, my morning routine, Frosted Flakes, Cookie Crisp, Fruit Loops, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I could go all day with these. I used to have 15 boxes of cereal at any given point in time and it was always my breakfast and usually like a dessert at the end of the night as well. So like... I've had my own persistent behaviors that I've wanted to shift and I would find success in short bursts and then I would inevitably fall back to the unwanted behavior. And I've also had some challenges shifting unwanted persistent behaviors with respect to my sex life. If you've listened to the show before, you know quite well that I spent four years recovering through Sex Addicts Anonymous. That's a part of my past. Sexting, pornography, sex, these were things that I would make promises to myself to upstand, to, to uphold a certain level of behavior. And then I constantly find myself breaking that promise. I'm not going to watch porn for the next week. And I watch porn the next day. 
right? Like I'm not going to sext women when I'm in a relationship. And I would find myself sexting women inside of while I was in a committed relationship. It didn't seem like I had control over my behaviors when in most other areas of my life, I felt quite disciplined. Now, I know that this is something that all of us struggle with. We all have our own demons. We all have our own struggles, whether it's with the food that we eat, whether it's through our sexual behaviors, maybe it's through workaholism, maybe it's through drinking or gambling. And one of the things that I have championed a lot in my writings, in my first book, Design Your Future, I've championed this on the podcast a number of times as well, are these temporary abstinence periods. And what I mean by a temporary abstinence period, it's a way for you to disrupt your negative relationship, your disempowering relationship with whatever behavior you're looking to change. So for example, you know, like let's use one of the, I don't know, it's not subtler, but maybe softer uh, compulsions that I've had to deal with in my life. So TV has always been a way for me to escape my mind. I have a hyperactive mind. Sometimes I can't get it to quiet down. But television, like really good television, drama, dramatic television, Netflix, when I turn on the TV and I can be swept away by a wonderful show, then it somehow seems to get rid of or at least quiet down that inner critic in my mind. Now, there was a period of time in my life where I would turn on a show and then I wouldn't be able to turn it off. You know, like one episode would have to roll into two, two would have to roll into three. And even when like the second episode, the third episode, I found myself like not really paying attention. I found myself multitasking, maybe on my phone or going in and out or being restless on the couch. I just kept going and going and going. And I found that like these multiple hours were slipping away each and every night, um, but I couldn't stop myself. And so when I found myself in this place of compulsion, my only way of really bringing back control was to overcorrect. And what I ended up doing to do these overcorrections were, well, I'm going to take, you know, the next week and not watch any TV or Netflix. In certain cases, I went really extreme. Like I'm going to take 50 days off and I'm not going to watch any television or Netflix. Now, the reason why I'm a big fan of these temporary abstinence periods is because when you feel like you have no control for a period of time, it is so like when you feel like you have no control with this behavior that is persisting, it is a win to experience and reclaim control, even if it's something as short as taking like 24 hours off of that behavior or taking a week off of Netflix or taking a few weeks off of eating dessert. Even just to be able to demonstrate that you have that level of control can remind you that you do have what it takes, at least for a temporary period, to create a behavior shift. And you need to be reminded of that, right? The other reason why I like the abstinence periods as well is because it helps to illuminate why I have that troubling pattern or behavior to begin with. You know, if, if I want to talk about like what I'm experiencing right now in this temporary fast that I'm on, I've recognized like over the course of just the last 36 hours, as I'm walking through the street of New York and I, I, I find myself like walking by these stores, it's just like, go grab a bagel, go grab a pizza, go grab a this. Like the, all these compulsions just kick up inside of me that are almost unconscious. And if I weren't on a fast, I, I totally, I, I guarantee that one of those compulsions that kicked up, get a coffee, get a bagel, get a muffin, get a whatever, I would have capitalized on if I weren't in the middle of a fast. But because I'm committed to this fast, I actually can have an awareness of all these like impulses that are kicking up all day long for me to satisfy them. I've wanted caffeine over the course of the day. I've wanted, you know, what was really interesting was yesterday on my very first day of the fast, because I didn't have the stimulation from caffeine, I didn't have the stimulation from sweet foods or much food at all. I found that I was super fucking horny yesterday because that was the thing that wanted, like, the, like when I engage with my sexuality, it sends a certain surge of electricity through my body that I wasn't feeling most, if not all of yesterday that I normally would with coffee and sweet foods or other delicious foods in my body. And so I could start to see through this abstinence period, like how my body works, how my physiology has been trained, how my emotions have been trained, how my energy has been trained. So these temporary abstinence periods are super, super helpful in illuminating 
um, what and why I do the things that I do. Now, one of the biggest disappointments from these temporary abstinence periods that I've experienced in the past is, okay, no day, you know, 50 days, no television, no Netflix. And then as soon as I started to turn the television back on, within the next like two or three weeks, I found that I'd be slipping back into these troubling behaviors again. And I couldn't quite figure out why. You know, I demonstrated such extraordinary, remarkable control for that period of time. And then like when I took the gates open again, it, feel, it felt like I just went back to where I was before, maybe with some more awareness, like I just talked about it, that, that, that gets kicked up during the abstinence period. But it almost actually created more cognitive dissonance because now I knew better and I was still doing the same thing and I would beat myself up. I know a lot of people who have gone through diets or who have gone through the program of like Alcoholics Anonymous where like you know better and then you keep slipping and you can really beat yourself up over it. For me, what I found that I needed to do like this, this crucial shift that I didn't really take into consideration when I did those abstinence periods is I didn't, I, I really didn't make it a conscious effort to say, I am looking to create a healthy, integrated relationship with this thing for the rest of my life. All I was really focused on was like crushing the 50 day goal. It was really a lot about like ego. Can I do this for 50 days? Can I tell people I'm doing this about this for 50 days and watch them marvel that I have the, the fortitude to do this for 50 days and also of course to learn about myself. But what I forgot to ask was, I plan on watching television for the rest of my life, right? <laughs> and I would like to have a healthy relationship with television for the rest of my life. And I don't feel like I have that now. So can I bring that also to the intentions of the next 50 days? or however long period of time that you're doing your thing for, or however long period of time I was doing my thing for, whether it was 100 days of no alcohol to start the new year, or this five-day fast. You know, one of the intentions I'm bringing with this five-day fast is, I would love to not be so dependent on caffeine or some of those like quick hit sweet treats that I found myself really indulging in over these last few weeks leading up to today, leading up to these last few days. Sometimes I feel like I don't have the authority the food or that compulsion has the authority over me. And I don't like that. So this fast is helping me because I'm bringing the intention to say for the rest of my life, I want to be eating foods that contribute to my lifelong well-being, that stave off any kinds of chronic or lifestyle diseases that I could be bringing upon myself by having a poor diet. And what I'm learning here in these next five days, because I do not intend to fast for the rest of my life, nor would that be healthy or safe. But what I do want to bring is a better relationship with things like caffeine, with things like sweets into the future. When I started to learn how to integrate and not just flop back and forth between these periods of being compulsed or over controlling through these abstinence periods and then going back to reverting back to default, when I really had a focus on integration and creating a lifetime relationship, then I started to find that my behaviors changed. And I'll give you some examples of that. With caffeine, like just maybe a year and a half ago, I found that I was drinking like two 20 ounce mugs of Bulletproof coffee. After the first 20 ounce mug of Bulletproof coffee, like I am good to go for the day. I do not need any more caffeine. But when I felt that craving and compulsion to drink the second one, well, I would do it because like I wanted that extra high. Whatever high I feel, I always want more. You know what I mean? Like, you know the feeling? It's like whenever you eat something sugary, you want more of that thing. Like, it just never seems to be like, good, I've got my, I've got my, like I've had my fill. I just want to keep going and going and going. With coffee, that was my thing until I burnt out my adrenals. Until I felt like, like tension in my body all day long. I felt snappy at other people. And so I wanted to shift that and my typical protocol for that would be to just go off caffeine for a week. Instead, I was like, no, I, want, I love caffeine. I love my coffee because it's a way for me to get out of bed in the morning. I love the ritual of making it, the smell, the taste. I love the creative ideas, the juices that get flowing when I drink caffeine. And I think I've referenced a book a few times during some of my, my solo quarantine 
podcasts about um, daily rituals of like the most talented, gifted creators, artists, leaders, visionaries of the world. Many of them, if not all of uh, many of them, most of them actually had a, a practice using coffee or caffeine to stimulate their, their best thinking. So I don't have any intentions of getting rid of coffee. I love it. But I didn't love how it commanded all of me. So what I decided to do was just scale back to one. And what I found was when I went to scale back to one 20 ounce mug of coffee. And what I found was like when I started to do that, I felt like throughout the rest of my day, my energy was spot on. I didn't feel that level of like anxiousness or anxiety or frustration or the jitters. And like 20 ounces seemed to be the perfect amount for me. Of course, when I finished my 20 ounce mug, there was that feeling of like, make another one, make another one, make another one. But that has since gone away because what I feel during the rest of the day is so much more important to me. That that, that great feeling I experienced over the course of the day actually has helped to dissolve that compulsion. You know, my coach David has told me, and he's been, and we've interviewed him on the show before as well. David Waldis, an interview with my coach is the name of that episode. David has said, you know, when it comes to behavior change, it really shouldn't have to be as hard as we make it. If we can focus on something desirable, then some of these unwanted behaviors just seem to fall away. That's exactly how my drinking curtailed. There was a period of time, maybe like 10 years ago, I probably between my 20s and 30s, no, I'm sorry, 20s up through my early 30s, where like drinking Friday and Saturday nights were an absolute given. And maybe a couple other nights a week through work events or a Thursday night going out on a date. But Friday, Saturday nights were an absolute given. And then I would wake up hungover, you know, wouldn't really be much of anything for the first few hours of the day. I might work in a workout on a Saturday or a Sunday and then, you know, get started drinking again. That was just kind of like how I rolled through like a decade of my life post-college. But then when I moved into the city and most of my friends got married and they went elsewhere, I found that I needed to find like new communities. So I started going to these workout classes at the Equinox. And my favorite Equinox class, which was run by my friend named Liz, was an abs class and a body conditioning class that started off at 12 noon, but then it got moved to like nine or 10 in the morning. And that class, I loved it because I could see how fit I was getting. I could feel my body being stronger. I could feel how I felt the rest of the day after I'd worked out that when that class moved to 10 a.m. in the morning, it actually started to stop me from drinking on Friday night because I didn't want to feel like shit for that Saturday morning class. And what was amazing was like, I didn't even have to think about stopping my drinking. It was just like, I didn't want to because I wanted to feel physically better on Saturday. And then when I felt really good on Saturday and I felt how shitty I felt on Sunday after drinking on Saturday night, then I started to just, not want to drink on Saturday nights anymore. Alcohol is, is, is a little to no part of my life anymore. You know, I might have a, a glass of wine with dinner, a beer with some buddies. I don't really like getting drunk anymore because for me, it just, it wipes me out for the next day. And it was never something that I actually had to make a conscious intention to reduce. It became because I actually prioritized something else that meant and mattered more to me and therefore drinking just didn't have a place in my life anymore. The same thing happened with me and fast food. You guys might not believe this, but like when I was a kid, it was like like teenager when I got my first car, five, six days a week, Burger King, Taco Bell, McDonald's. In college, I graduated sophomore year and had to throw out 150 of those Taco Bell souvenir cups that you get when you supersize a meal. They weren't all mine, they were mine and my roommates, but 150 because after midnight, we would get the munchies and four nights a week, if we weren't drinking, we'd go to Taco Bell. I was 35 pounds heavier than I am. Uh, yeah, 30 to 35 pounds heavier than I am now in the worst shape of my life. But when I graduated college and when I started working out again, I found that like eating crappy food just didn't jive with my workouts. It made me feel worse. And when I started to prioritize workouts, it started to reduce, like the, the draw to eating crappy food, fast food, started to dissipate. Now, I can't remember the last time I had fast food, Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's, and I don't even have a craving for it, which is shocking to me because for most of, for many years, 
over a decade period of time, probably a couple decades, fast food I was compulsed by. And so I think what's really helpful about this conversation is to realize that many of these behaviors don't shift overnight. They take a concerted effort. They take a conscious effort to, to not just eradicate, but to integrate over a period of time. You know, and I've had to learn how to do that with sex and masturbation and pornography because when I went through Sex Addicts Anonymous, it was all about the abstinence. No masturbation, no porn. Um, but I figured I was going to be living the rest of my life and I didn't want to make, take porn completely off the table or masturbation completely off the table. I did for four consecutive years. But then I decided that I'm going to figure out how to integrate this so it doesn't feel like a white knuckled, gripping, um, painful, controlling experience every single day. So for you, if you can move through that place of feeling compulsed by, then over controlling to moving it back to something that's more integrated by testing over and over and over again, by bringing new questions to each of those experiences. What am I learning now that I didn't learn before? By bringing the conversation that James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits, instead of changing your behavior, focus on changing your identity. So instead of being the guy who says, I'm no longer going to watch television. I'm no longer going to drink caffeine. I'm no longer going to eat desserts. I'm no longer going to drink anymore. Instead, focus on your identity, who you are at your core. I am a man discovering and living the great man inside of me. I am vigilant about what I put in my body because I know the fuel that I put in here dramatically impacts my ability to show up the best version of myself every single day. Even when I feel a craving to put something in my body that I know is not going to be good for me, I will stop and ask, what would the great man inside of me do in this moment? Now listen, none of these things are going to instantly change your persistent and unwanted behaviors overnight. There is no silver bullet. You know that. I know that. And... If you are willing to stay committed to the long game and playing this for the rest of your life, regardless of what behavior it is that you're looking to shift, if you're willing to stay on this path and get creative, to run experiments, to keep the intention of not just over-controlling or over-correcting your behaviors, but instead to build empowering, integrated, healthy relationships with your behaviors that will serve you over the course of your lifetime, because in the long run, playing that game, you cannot be beaten.